Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a thrill to be here on this important evening. And, uh, and these panelists, three panelists that I would love to have on television again soon. Uh, first, next to me, uh, Harry Evans, uh, the author of many books, but most recently, the one that you're all going to receive uh, in just a few minutes here, Do I Make Myself Clear? Uh, of course, I think you all know uh, Harry is an award-winning broadcaster, writer, uh, as I said, author of many books, uh, editor-at-large at, at, at Reuters. Next to him is Nancy Gibbs, uh, editor of Time Magazine. Uh, she's got a very busy uh, couple of days now uh, working on the next issue in light of tonight's news about the president. We'll talk about that. And next to her, Dan Rather. Uh, you all know Dan Rather for his many years uh, at CBS uh, and is uh, now on television on Axis TV with his interviews, uh, also writing on Facebook, uh, maybe uh, one of the foremost viral authors on Facebook and working on a book uh, based on those essays right now. So lots to discuss. Harry, what should members of the Trump administration learn from your book about writing clearly, writing well? Oh my God, that was a question. I sometimes <laughs> think they should speak in color code. Uh, first of all, they start up with a red. This is a lie. Then they go to a purple. This is half a lie. Then they go to yellow, which is half a lie, but it's funny. Then they go to green. You can't believe this either, but nonetheless, forget it all, because I'm going to say something very different tomorrow. So I would like them to have an editor who can somehow indicate what, uh, that we take seriously. Now, let me do climate change just for one moment, because this is uh, 41st president on this very important issue of climate change. He's very low on his list, he said. I am not a believer. And unless somebody can prove something to me, I believe the weather changes. I believe it goes up and it goes down. And it goes up again and it goes down again. <laughs> and it changes depending on years and centuries. But I am not a believer and we have much bigger problems. Well, I'm happy to leave those bigger problems to him, but I wish it'd be expressed a little more succinctly. So you see it happening over and over again, these different colors, yeah, starting yeah. with a lie, yeah, yeah, then well, we I mean, get to the truth, and very, then start all over again. It's very difficult. The Oxford English Dictionary has said that the, we're living in the post-truth society. Do you and think that's true? Po yes, I do. Because actually, uh, in my book, I include a quote from the Tea Party spokesman who said, there are no such things as facts. There's no such thing as facts. Everybody has different opinions, and the common equation of those opinions is the truth. Mm. Well, you could have told that to a number of famous inventors. And so we are in a difficult position because in this audience, if I asked in this audience, if I might... Let's hear it. How many people here believe the president tells the truth? <laughs> no, seriously. No, and, and would you dare use the word lie, or would you call it a falsehood? So we have to be precise because I've uttered many falsehoods I believe to be true at the time. Does the president believe to be true what he's saying when he says it? Or is it a lie? And it's curious. It's, uh, I've been looking at the press generally, including Time magazine and New York Times. And the New York Times caused a sensation in journalistic terms last year when it actually said the birth of thing is a lie. What? He's actually accused the President of the United States of lying? Well, they hadn't got used to it during the campaign. So I think we have a very difficult time because now truth is hostage. Truth is a real hostage. And what's more important to it, in my view, and I mentioned this, is that the people who, don't, who want to talk like that, that Tea Party lady want you to lose faith in the institutions we have judiciary, academia, and journalism. Lose faith in them, because then where is the certainty? So you're fighting a battle for truth the whole time. And therefore, that means you must be fair to the untruth tellers as well as to the truth tellers. And I think mm. it's crazy. Well, these two people here, I mean, <laughs> just grill them on how they decide what they're going to run. <laughs> it's interesting, because Nancy, you had a cover of time in March about this exact topic whether we're post-truth. Uh, and uh, I believe your reporters back then interviewed the president about it. And again, last week interviewed the president. He's accessible, but access isn't all that matters when figuring out what's true or not. No, although I think the question that is as important or maybe more important um, is what he believes. And, and what struck me when, certainly last week, 
when we were interviewing him is so much of what he was saying, which is demonstrably not factually accurate, is by any measure not true, and yet I swear to God I come away believing that he thinks that it is. Not in every case, um, but in many cases where you can, this is why people have said, is this, is this delusional? Is this you know, only believing what he wants to believe? But it is, there is something fundamentally more disturbing about facts having mo no power over, or evidence having no power over the chief executive of the country. And so, you know, pe many people have pointed out, and there's plenty of evidence for it, that at different times every president has lied. They've lied for good reasons, they've lied for bad reasons, they have said things that were not true, knowingly, unknowingly. We're dealing with something that is, that is fundamentally different. It's a tremendous challenge to our profession. Um, but to me as a journalist, what challenged me most was sitting there listening to him over the better part of three hours mm. and trying, trying to, to discern at each point, okay, he is, he is telling a story to a journalist, he is trying to sell me on his version of his presidency. Um, I get that this is the story that he wants to get out, but if this is also the story that he believes, that everything is doing is going wonderfully and why don't people appreciate what a great job he's doing for the American people, that's a very different kind of mental space to be operating in. Harry, if the president believes it, is he lying? Is he lying? If he believes what he's saying? No, he's just a fantasist. Hmm. That's all he believes, he lives in his own world. There are no such things as facts anymore. I don't, his opinion is as good as the nearest climate scientist. It's as good as Dan Rather's opinion. It's actually better than Nancy's opinion because she's a woman. So they don't have really convincing opinions, the women, as we hear from in many occasions. So I have to regard him as a kind of, we had a presentation before this evening started. A holo, I regard him as a hologram. And he <laughs> doesn't make bushes burn, not even bushes in the presidential <laughs> nomenclature. But he believes, I believe, I do believe he's believing what he, he says. Mm. I don't think, to be absolutely awful about it, because you should, you should speak with a certain reverence for the politician who happens to be the president, I don't think he has the imagination, actually, to keep inventing different lies, fantasies, untruth. I, he lives in a world of his own. That's the trouble. Mm. Dan, we learned about the Washington Post story at 4 p.m., 5 p.m. today uh, about the president apparently revealing highly classified information to the Russian foreign minister in the Oval Office last week. First of all, what was your reaction to that story in the Washington Post that's now dominating the news cycle? And is the president competent to be president? Well, I don't feel myself qualified to say whether he's competent to be president or not. But this story, uh, if true, and it isn't just the Washington Post now, mm -hmm. others have since confirmed it, right. uh, demonstrates that he is, at a, at a very minimum, uh, dangerously reckless uh, and very much uninformed. Uh, at the very minimum, mm -hmm. those two things. Now, if you look at his presidency so far, and I may have a, at least a slight disagreement uh, with my colleagues here, uh, that I agree that a president should be given the benefit of any reasonable doubt. Mm. And I do agree that there's a difference between a falsehood and a lie. But... You don't believe there's a difference? Uh, there is a difference. He does. Oh, there is a difference. Go, go, okay, go. But, yeah, okay, but a lie is a lie is a lie. <laughs> and the line is, we, we, you discussed, and I believe both of you discussed with you, a little unsure what's in his head. When he says that he hasn't released his tax returns uh, because uh, there's, uh, it's still being processed. Uh, I think it's very clear he's lying. Mm. And I do think it's important when it is a lie, when it's a demonstrable lie, it should be called a lie. Uh, and you of all people, Harry, wanting clarity and precision of language, uh, I would think would agree, when it's a lie, it should be called a lie. You shouldn't dance around it and say, well, he spoke an untruth or he spoke a falsehood. I agree we should be careful about the use of the word lie, mm. but we shouldn't hide behind some journalistic tradition of saying, well, a president, you never say that a president lies. When he lies, he should be called to account uh, for the lying. Mm. And what we've had, you know, is, is one falsehood, untruth, sometimes lies after another. And 
what we're left with on the basis of his performance so far is that you cannot trust anything this president says. I agree previous presidents have dealt in falsehoods, lies, misleading statements. But with this president, he's established uh, that you just can't believe anything that he says. I edited Nixon's last book, and I wrote about him in my other book. And I believe that Nixon always knew when he was lying. I think that's the big difference. I would agree. With that. I would he agree. He knew he was telling a lie. I'm not so sure he does, this president. Yeah. Well, uh, I think sometimes he knows he's lying. I, I think he knew that the inaugural crowd was not the all-time greatest crowd or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't think, I think he knew that. And if he, if, if he, if he said it the first time, because he really believed in his own mind, once the demonstrated evidence was put to him, and he continued to say that the crowd was larger, that's a lie. So let me just offer a counter to that. Sure. Exactly this time a week ago, I was walking with him through the West Wing and he stopped in front of a photograph of the inauguration. Ah. And he proceeded to explain how much bigger the crowd was off to this side that you couldn't see in the image and to this side and, and for and then there was another photograph that had been up on the wall that had been taken down. And he asked that it be found, because they rotate them, that it be found and brought so that he could, again, explain actually that the crowd was the biggest ever. This is, a, this is now. And this you believed it? Not. So my, the more important question is to me of why is this the story that he would be insisting to tell me in this moment. It, well, two points. We've seen the pictures, right. the, the evidence is there, and yet for, a, you know, to, to spend 15 minutes relitigating crowd size in front of a photograph, mm -hmm. in front of a photograph, hmm. what, I don't have an answer to what that tells us. It, it seems so must obviously. must have some guesses though. Well, so it seems so obviously counterproductive mm. and, and self-destructive, not in the interest of, mm. of whatever message, you know, presidents, you know how careful any organized White House is. This is the message of the week. It's going to be that we got health care through the they House. They would have you stop by one photo on purpose. Or it's going to, to be about, about our foreign story, trip right, next week, and right. here's what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia. Right. There are lots of messages that they need to get out. And so relitigating inaugural crowd size, the thing that we have seen, the, the, we're in a different kind of place that that's the, the best analysis of Mr. Trump's behavior is from the author of Gulliver's Travels. They weren't around at the same time. That was, I'm talking about the 17th century. I, I don't think he was around in the 17th century. Uh, uh, Jonathan Swift has a fantastic description of Mr. Trump in action. Mm. He says, and you read it, I've, I've quoted it in my book, He's, he says, Here's a politician. He's actually using these words. Here's a politician who says one thing and then denies it the next day and so on. And then he explains the whole phenomenon. So I recommend, instead of reading my book, go and read Gulliver's <laughs> Travels. <laughs> oh, read no, your, I, I disagree. I think, you should, I think you should read your book. It's really Let delightful. me just put a quote on, on at least this part of the discussion, perhaps. That there are things that are facts. There are such things as facts. And we talked earlier about being in the post-truth political era, and you spoke eloquently about how confusing it is facts. There are facts. Two and two equals four. It does not equal five. There's no alternate fact to two and two equal four. Water does not run uphill. There is such a thing <laughs> as gravity. It's a fact. That's not an arguable fact. So the president can use this technique of talking at length and bringing up this, that, and the other but when it comes to facts that are demonstrable facts, and at the very least, while you and I may disagree about whether ever to use the word lie or not, when it's a fact, it should be pointed out that it's a fact. He should not be allowed to get away with mm -hmm. sort of saying, well, they're alternate facts. As I pointed out, there's some things about which there are no alternate facts. If I look into the camera, or if you look into the camera, Dan, and say, no, the president did not invent the term priming the pump, <laughs> 40% 40, 40 of the country, according to polls, is not going to believe me and is not going to believe That's you. Right. I, I wonder, Harry, are there, are there lessons here? 
uh, you talk a lot about, about editors, about the, <laughs> the importance of the editor helping structure your writing, structure your thinking. Uh, is there something that, that you can prescribe to help journalists and anchors reach part of the country that it's not convinced right now? Yeah, I think it's, you know, one of my friends who's a Trump supporter said he tells it like it is. I said that's exactly what he doesn't do. And so I directed him to some passages and I said, now defend this passage, defend that passage, defend. Mm. Well, you do this on CNN and do it very well, if I may say so. Thank you. But the, the unfortunately, we're living in an age of maximum confusion about language. Everything is becoming highly relative. Look what's happening in the universities where a speaker with a contrary position gets howled down. You know this, your daughter's at Brown, where that sometimes happens. So we're all of us involved in this, everybody in this audience and outside, we're involved in this battle to give a halo to truth. And that's not easy because people do not know how to express things truly. The language, I look at business communications every day. What am I looking for? I'm looking for great big ugly fish that shouldn't be in the water. Mm. I mean, the business language is absolutely appalling. When <laughs> it's, it's full of, there's all these organizations which are dedicated to science. They're actually not. They're dedicated to denying climate change. They're dedicated to motherhood. They're not. They're dedicated to keeping out Planned Parenthood from providing contraception for women. And so, so we're living in an age where there's a vast volatility of messages coming, most of which are not true, many of which are highly deceptive. When you sign a mortgage, when people signed mortgages in the millions before the Great Recession, and, and they, they were lied to, and they, were li they lied to themselves. And so we are in a real crisis. So much words flowing through the internet, so lack of precision in the language, so encouraged by marketing bullshit. That's the only one word for it. I'm sorry if I'm offended to anybody. It's an effective word. Right to my public affairs office. Okay. <laughs> so I think we're in a real crisis. Now, Dan and Nancy and you, I'm going to give you this point. I actually try very hard to pin this down, but it's very difficult. It needs everybody in this audience not to let unclear expressions survive. And when they write, they must make sure that they're writing in the active voice, they're using simple language, they're using concrete terms instead of abstractions. And that's the value of this book. Uh, this book has an added advantage of being a pleasurable read as well as being a textbook. But if, to anybody who wants to know how to do what Harry just described, uh, when, uh, that uh, read the book because <laughs> it's in there. And it, he preaches the gospel and, and does it so pleasurably because Harold has, he has a very good sense of humor among other things, uh, is to make it clear, there are very simple rules such as virtually do away with adverbs and use extremely sparingly adjectives and use strong verbs short sentences, write and rewrite, because writing begins really with rewriting. And if you follow those simple rules, uh, which the book lays out in, in a very uh, sometimes humorous, always understandable way, you will be able to do just what you just described. Yes, one, one person, I must shut up. But, uh, just one thing, the active voice, which you use very well in Time Magazine, the active voice. And the antithesis is the, is, is the passive voice, the cover your ass passive, as it's called. <laughs> and, and the cover your ass passive, I'll give you an example of a passive. The moon was landed on today by Neil Armstrong. <laughs> That's a passive sentence. That's the kind of thing. Now, you might laugh at that instead of saying Neil Armstrong landed on the moon today. But actually, the, that passive sentence, which I've just said, mm. runs right through the bureaucracy in Washington, runs right through a lot of journalism, and is actually rampant in business communication. Mm. You know, uh, uh, it was decided that coffee would not be served at 11 o'clock. What do you mean, it was decided? <laughs> passive. Who decided it? Well, f Joe Smith decided. Where is Joe Smith? We can go and deal with him. See what I mean? The evasion of responsibility is built into the passive voice. So when you find yourself using the passive voice, mm. most of the time you're evading responsibility. Mistakes were made. Mistakes but, were made. Not er up here. And steps were taken. <laughs> steps avoid. were taken. Steps were taken. Uh, let's get to the fun part. Questions from the audience. I was just told we have a mic uh, that we can use uh, to hear you all loud and clear. So depending on where that mic is, let's go right here in the 
third row first. Let's see if we can get the microphone over to you. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, everyone up there. I just wonder, is there a little fight, if you will, between print journalism and broadcast journalism in that print journalism thinks that they have to clean up a mess created by broadcast journalism. Ooh. What is that mess? That our president was given free access. Uh, he was, his appearance by telephone on many of the shows right. was broadcast an hour before he came on. He was not challenged, and rightfully so. Everybody likes a train wreck. Who knew what he was going to say? And just like in the early 1970s, and Mr. Rather was there, print journalism came and saved everybody. And I wonder whether the print journalists believe that they are cleaning up broadcast mess, and whether broadcast journalism has an obligation to do less opinion and more hard research and reporting. Nancy? I, you know, I would throw that back to you. Ah. I, because I, I think what's remarkable right now is, is, and just when I would argue we as citizens have most reason to be grateful for it, is there is extraordinary journalism being committed okay. uh, minute to minute and hour to hour on every platform mm -hmm. in the in the most traditional legacy you know media of of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and mm -hmm. Time, but um, but also at the broadcast networks and at the cable networks and on digital only you know very new fresh brands that didn't exist five years ago mm -hmm. who are you know who are taking this moment in the country's history as a challenge and I don't just mean what's happening in on Pennsylvania Avenue. I think one of the most important things is that this story is a, a story that is living in every community in this yeah. country. And it's so hard to take our eyes off of what's happening mm. in the West Wing that we are missing a really critical story. And so thank heavens we are at a time where there is so much work that is being published on every platform all around the country, because how this is being received, mm -hmm. how people are watching this and responding to it, we are seeing divides in people's perception yeah. of what each news cycle means, what each new revelation means, whether it's something to be inspired by or alarmed by, that I actually think this is, this is, this is a moment where traditional rivalries between news organizations have kind of been set aside because everyone realizes we, are, we have a very important mission and story to tell, and it's one that, mm. that is sort of beyond the ability of all of us collectively, and if we're, if we're arguing amongst ourselves, then mm -hmm. we're really missing the responsibility well, that we well, have. Well, there has been something, I, I hesitate to call it a renaissance, but there's certainly been at least an uptick in what I call deep digging investigative reporting in both print and broadcast. And as one who spent most of my life, not all, in broadcast, print does a better jo job, generally speaking, and overall in the main, with the kind of deep drilling investigative reporting mm -hmm. uh, that we're seeing some comeback of at the moment. However, even in broadcast journalism, there's been some, re some limited rededication to investigative reporting, and not because Brian is a representative of CNN here, but CNN has put together a very impressive group of investigative journalists, and they've broken some stories. And uh, the way I'd leave this is, let's hope this continues, because a lot of good investigative reporting is being done now, more than has been done in most of the last decade. Oh, yes, and the question is, how do we get the Trump voters to believe it? So every time we make a mistake, when I was newspaper editor, I knew I was devaluing my own career and so on and so on, right. so wanted to correct it immediately. And of course, we, we in the press used to be reluctant to do that. I agree with Nancy and Dan, actually. The press is now much more willing to admit mistakes, right. to correct them, and I'm hoping that's going to seep through to the general populace who will no longer tell me he tells it like it is. Hmm. 
And I would just add that every medium has strengths and weaknesses. Print has certain strengths you were describing about the ability to go off for months and do investigative reporting. TV has strengths tied to immediacy and to emotion and to, to compassion. Uh, I always, to your original question, want to shift a little bit more toward reporters and a little bit less toward the opinion people, while definitely having both. Just a little bit more all the time toward the reporting side. And in the past week, ever since Friday, it's 545 when Comey was fired. I don't know about you guys, but I've actually felt that happen on television, especially on CNN, but elsewhere too. A shift toward more reporters and fewer opinion people. Yeah, right, because right. Because the stakes are so high and there's so much to report. There's so much news happening. That's right. That we're seeing a lot of reporters on TV. And that, mm, sorry, that's why it's so dangerous to talk about. I don't mind the libel laws. I've been in many libel cases. I only ever lost one, which was that said somebody who destroyed a historic building was a vandal and it was ruled against me. Anyway, that was the only one I lost in libel. So libel is a very important thing, but it cannot be made an excuse for chilling and silencing the press, which is what we're being threatened with. You know, don't forget, after all those people, how many people, three million sneaked into the voting booth? Remember that? Oh, all those yeah, people. Three to five and, and, yeah, well, I've got a photograph of the three million sneaking in. I can prove it to you. Just happened to have fabricated this afternoon. But anyway, the point is, all those people who sneaked into those voting booths, it's been denounced and denied. And yet, all the people I speak to outside New York City believe it. Mm. They were, they, they, there's a guy in Kansas at the moment actually doing an investigation to prove that there were three million frauds. So how can, how can, I shouldn't say this really, but how can we get the truth in? Hmm. Brian, this may be as good a place as any, do I make myself clear. <laughs> uh, that, uh, the author of this book, seated to my left, when he was editor, his newspaper broke some of the biggest, deepest investigative stories of his time. And if, there, if there's no other reason, there are plenty of other reasons to read the book, is to salute that work that he did when he was working in Great Britain mm. and broke, had world exclusives on really important investigative stories. That, that reminds me, Harry, one more question before we go back to the audience. Should the American press have some more traits of the British press? Are there elements <coughs> of the British press you'd like to see the American press adopt more? Well, the, the uh, British press, and when I left it alone, it was better designed. <laughs> but, <laughs> But the, I had a lunch today with the former editor of the London Times, which I edited, and it's Simon Jenkins, and he was saying to me exactly what um, our companions have said. He said, I'm so impressed what the American press is now doing and how well written it is today, in both in the opinion and the factual side. Okay. And that's not something he would have said 10 or even 20 years ago. There's some positivity. Let's see uh, where the microphone is. You're, you're the boss, you got the mic. Um, this is for Dan, rather. Uh, hello, Dan. It's Tim. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in how you know you have really taken uh, fire on social media, on Facebook, writing with enormous vim and uh, connective clarity, and, and getting a huge following. Do you change your uh, approach as a writer and as a communicator on social media to how you did on television? And what do you get from that communication that you did not get? from broadcast. Brian, if you could help me. Thank yeah, and you. on Facebook, when you're getting millions of shares, yeah. are you writing differently on social media than you would write for television? Yes, I am writing differently on social media than How so? for television. Well, for te television uh, lends itself to one, sh a very short sentence structure. Comes out of the radio tradition, a very short mm -hmm. sentence structure. And television writing, we're talking about television news writing, mm -hmm. uh, to use a phrase that someone used in describing uh, what uh, uh, Do I Make Myself Clear points out, that eloquence is under siege. Well, eloquence is always under siege in television news. And uh, I do write differently when I write on Facebook or file something for our companion internet site called News and Guts, in that I do work, work harder, if you will, to be as eloquent as I'm capable of being, mm. which is not very eloquent. But the answer is yes, I do, do write differently. A little more exposition. And, and what also, about the feedback? The other part of Tina's question was about the feedback you get in the Facebook comments threads. Does that affect your work? It does affect the work, at least on the margins. 
and I was going to say, this is one of the other differences in writing for something like Facebook, uh, is that you immediately get, it's a two-way communication. Hmm. If you anchor the CBS Evening News, you appear every evening, people don't talk back to you, sometimes they send you letters and that sort of thing. <laughs> but it, it's instant feedback on Facebook. Yeah. And uh, I can't possibly read every comment on Facebook, but I take a sampling of those comments, and sometimes I will follow up and try to address those. Yeah. And they also are very helpful in sort of framing what I'm going to write next or somewhere down the line, yeah. what gets through. But I will say the most, the single most uh, advantageous thing about having instant feedback on Facebook is knowing whether you have made yourself clear. <laughs> if you haven't made yourself clear, you'll hear about it right away. Things like, what the hell is this man talking about? <laughs> and you're, you're apt to get more shares and go more viral if you're being clear, if you're being concise. Absolutely. Interesting. Uh, let's see if we can get one or two more questions. Uh, there's the microphone. <laughs> Great. <laughs> On the question of truth, I have a simple question. Was Barack Obama telling the truth when he said, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan? And what was that? Harry, uh, was it President Obama telling the truth when he said, if you like your health care plan, oh. you can keep your plan? Oh, this, I'm glad you asked that question. It was enabled me to refer you to about seven or eight pages I've written on that statement. <laughs> he believed it was true when he said it, that he was a falsehood, not a lie. But I've gone through the entire health plan and the language that was used. And I said, first of all, I'm actually skeptical, you'll be surprised to hear, of the present Republican health plan. It seems to me made of straw. However, in an analyzing the health plans, which have done a great length actually towards the end of the book, because I looked into the conditions of insurance, which are fraudulent. I mean, one single thing I want to just get in this mention. One boy with cerebral palsy who needed physical therapy and speech therapy was denied speech therapy on a comprehensive policy by travelers because they said, we promised to restore speech, but he hasn't spoken, therefore there's nothing to restore, mm. which is a cruel condemnation of that person to live in silence. So, yes, I think it was a falsehood by Obama, a misunderstanding, if you like, uh, in some of the opaque expressions that ran through the Affordable Care Act, but nothing, I call it the Affordable Scare Act because there are more lies told about the Affordable Care Act that they deserve the title of the Affordable Scare Act. And I've identified some of those in the book. Does misleading behavior by any politician tar all politicians and make it harder to recognize when the current president is categorically different than others? Ask one of these people. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tanny, Tanny went up here. That's so brilliant, come on. <laughs> you know, I, I think everyone has sort of, President Trump's fans and his critics are, are the one piece of consensus is that you cannot really compare him usefully to any of the first 44. We are just mm. in a place that is so different. And, and for some people, and this is the important point about that, if you, if you go back to the exit polling on election day, right. when you ask people why they voted the way they did, large numbers of people said, he doesn't have the experience to be president, we don't think he's honest and trustworthy, he doesn't have the temperament. Uh, in all of those categories, um, Secretary Clinton outranked him by significant mm -hmm. margins. On the question of who can bring about needed change, right. there was a 50 point gap and that's what people voted for. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the critical question in my mind that I'm most curious about, what I want my reporters to yeah. help explain to me, is is this the change that people expected, wanted, you know, to some extent, the fact that we are seeing things that we have never seen before, that we are in territory we have never visited before, is what the election was, was about. Was about. Right. And so how that is being processed and received, I think, is, is <coughs> is important in its own way because that is that is what the voters were voting for. They right. were voting for something Except very different. Not a majority of them. Not a majority of them, but that was the, of of all of the factors that was decisive in their vote. Right. And it was and it spoke to a discontent 
across the board shared by people in both parties with our institutions, with the way that policy was made, with the way that, that, that Washington was organized, the, with the way that campaigns were financed, with all sorts of fundamental structural and institutional shortcomings that, you know, in a sense, it was a cry of desperation. And to the extent that large numbers of people look at where we are now and think that we are in a desperate situation now, we have been on a, on a path of desperation now for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's a shortcut to get out of it. Time for our last question, so no pressure on who's gonna go last, okay. but uh, here we go. Last week when, um, when Comey was fired, everybody was calling Trump Nixonian. Now, I just heard the news that you guys said this evening that uh, he shared state secrets with the Russians, which could, which could be considered traitorous. Um, anybody care to speculate about possible impeachment or how this presidency or this, this administration is gonna fare? Dan, why don't you go first? I think you've covered an impeachment or two. Uh, the question was about, given tonight's news uh, about Russia, uh, do you see a path toward impeachment? Would you like to speculate about how this story ends? Well, uh, there certainly are paths to imp impeachment, uh, but I think it's far too soon to start talking in terms of impeachment of President uh, Trump, primarily because not only does the Republican Party, such as it is, control the presidency, uh, the executive branch, but they have control of both houses of Congress. And as you know, you have to get articles of impeachment in the House and the trial is in the Senate. So I think talk of uh, his possibly being Im impeached is understandable and it's not outside the realm of possibility you're going to be impeached. But uh, one could be easily misled by things up to the present time. It takes a lot to get an impeachment uh, of a president. It's a long, arduous, process, and because the Republicans control the levers of power, I think, <coughs> this, is, this is my opinion, clearly labeled, there's a danger for, uh, for those who uh, virulently oppose President Trump and for the Democratic Party, and to be lulled into the sense of, listen, this can't go on, so impeachment is sort of inevitable. I would have to say, I haven't checked Las Vegas, but right now, uh, the heavy odds are that, as of this moment, who knows what tomorrow brings? Uh, the odds are pretty strong. That if, he, if he cares to do so, he'll be able to finish his first term, and I wouldn't rule out the possibility that he'd be a very strong candidate in the second term if he uh, chooses to, to do so. Now, all of that is set against the background of every time I have said this over the span of the <laughs> Trump presidency, something comes up like the FBI firing and a few days later uh, revealing secrets to the Russians. I do agree. If the mistakes continue uh, at this pace for very long, there's going to be more talk of impeachment. And one final thing, just a reminder, particularly given tonight's news, so much depends on how many, if any, of the leading Republican office holders, we're talking now people in the Senate and the House leadership, how many of them are willing to put the country first rather than the party and the presidential power their party enjoys first is the key question uh, wrapped up in the answer to your question. Mm. Nancy, any thoughts? Just the very practical question about tonight is that um, if almost anyone else had revealed the information, they would potentially have much more legal exposure. The president has a unique um, right to decide what is and is not classified. Mm. And so the fact of his choosing to share it, while it may have been extremely unwise and reckless and ill-advised, does not mean that it's illegal. Mm -hmm. just by the nature of his position. Right. Harry, any closing words for us on... Uh, yes, Harry, you, you advise in your book, and in, in, in effect, uh, have something to say, say it, and say it clearly. <laughs> Now's your chance. <laughs> How can I, look, you've been vivid in your clarity. How can I compete with a legend of all, my lifetime? That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your all uh, copies of the book on the way out and thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful audience. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs>